This week on Vaticano, explore how the Vatican's new document, The Bishop of Rome, is fostering Christian unity, uncover the alarming rise in Christian persecution around the world, and visit the Mamertine prison in Rome, where the apostles Peter and Paul were imprisoned shortly before they were martyred. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. It's a gesture that goes back to Holy Scripture. When Pope Francis blessed a total of 42 Pallia last Saturday and presented them to new archbishops, it reminded them of the basic mission of Jesus Christ. A pallium is a band made of sheep's wool and symbolizes the sheep from God's flock that the shepherd puts on his shoulders to carry them safely through dangers. It's also adorned with six black silk crosses and will be placed on the shoulders of the 42 new Metropolitan Archbishops who were appointed during the last year. Today, the Metropolitan Archbishops appointed in the last year received the pallium. In communion with Peter and following the example of Christ, the gate for the sheep, they are called to be zealous shepherds who open the doors of the gospel and through their ministry help to build a church and a society of open doors. Only Metropolitan Archbishops and the Latin Rite Patriarch of Jerusalem are imposed with a white pallium with black crosses as a symbol of communion, authority and unity with the Pope in his pastoral mission to be a shepherd for the people of God. Traditionally, this ceremony takes place on June the 29th, the solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul. Both apostles suffered martyrdom for Christ here in the Eternal City. The apostles Peter and Paul witnessed firsthand the work of God, who opened the doors of their interior prisons, but also the actual prisons into which they were thrown because of the gospel. The Lord also opened before them the doors of evangelization so they could have the joy of encountering their brothers and sisters in the fledgling communities and bring the hope of the gospel to all. Now this year, we also are preparing to open the holy door. Pope Francis will open the holy door on December the 24th for the Jubilee. Rome is expecting a new record number of visitors and pilgrims to come to the city of the apostles Peter and Paul for this occasion. Pope Francis is slowing down his liturgical schedule a bit this summer as he prepares to head out on the longest international trip of his pontificate in September. The 87-year-old Pope doesn't have any public masses on his schedule for eight weeks in July and August, according to the Master of Papal Liturgical Ceremonies official schedule. The Pope's current calendar has him taking a break from public liturgies from July the 8th to September the 1st. Prior to that, he's expected to preside over at least three events on his liturgical schedule. Throughout his pontificate, Pope Francis has opted for a busier summer schedule than his predecessors, making international trips, creating new cardinals, establishing new church celebrations, and famously, foregoing the traditional summer retreat to the papal residence at Castel Gandolfo. Yet, Pope Francis has continued the tradition of taking the month of July off from his public audiences, with the exception of the Sunday Angelus, something that in recent years has given him the chance to recover from medical surgeries in June of 2023 and July of 2021. Pope Francis has yet to make any international trips so far in 2024, but he has two on his schedule for the fall, including an ambitious two-week tour of Southeast Asia and Oceania, with stops in Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, East Timor, and Singapore. Pope Francis presided over Mass for the Solemnity of Saints Peter and Paul, the co-patrons of the city of Rome in St. Peter's Basilica on June the 29th. On July the 1st, Pope Francis convened a consistory of cardinals concerning the upcoming canonization of new saints. The Vatican has revealed that the Pope will also make another pastoral visit within Italy before taking a bit of a break from travel. 
This time, the Pope will travel to the northern Italian city of Trieste for a day trip on July the 7th. The Pope also participated in the G7 summit in June to speak about the ethics of artificial intelligence. Pope Francis will not hold his usual Wednesday audiences in St. Peter's Square throughout the month of July, but visitors to Rome hoping to catch a glimpse of the Pope will still be able to spot him each Sunday at noon as he appears in the window of the Apostolic Palace for the Angelus Prayer. Hello and welcome to this week's Vaticano Updates, the most important news from the Holy Father and the Vatican. French Cardinal Dominique Mamberti has been appointed protodeacon of the Vatican. In this role, he will announce the new pope after conclave, beginning with the famous Latin words, Habemus Papam. Since 2014, Mamberti has served as prefect of the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Signature. Pope Francis urged the faithful to extend Christian charity to all of God's creation and commit to protecting the environment. He made these remarks in a message ahead of World Day of Prayer for the Care of Creation observed annually on September the 1st since its establishment by Pope Francis himself in 2015. Pope Francis has also issued new regulations for employees of the fabric of St. Peter, requiring them to profess the Catholic faith, wear appropriate clothing and avoid visible tattoos or piercings. Employees must provide baptism and confirmation certificates, live according to Catholic principles, and have no criminal record. In his latest motu proprio titled Fratello Sole, brother, son in English, Pope Francis announced measures to transition Vatican City to solar energy as its primary electricity source. He has directed Vatican governing bodies to collaborate with Italian authorities to build an agrivoltaic system in Santa Maria di Galleria, an extraterritorial area outside of Rome for farming and solar energy production. On October the 20th, Pope Francis will celebrate a mass of canonization for 14 people, including the 11 martyrs of Damascus, who were murdered out of hatred for the faith on the night of July the 9th, 1860, in Damascus, Syria. The canonization date for Blessed Carlo Acutis will be announced later. Thank you so much for watching this week's Vaticano updates. In Rome, Andreas Tonhauser for EWTN Vaticano. Stay tuned as we'll soon take a closer look at the ongoing ecumenical dialogue concerning the role of the Pope in the exercise of the Petrine ministry, right here on Vaticano. Papa. Voy a pedir que You know that it was the duty of the conclave to give Rome a bishop. Sembra que It seems that my brother cardinals have gone to the ends of the earth to get one. But here we are. I thank you for your welcome. The diocesan community of Rome now has its bishop. Grazie. When Pope Francis addressed the faithful for the first time shortly after his election, many were surprised at how much he emphasized his role as the Bishop of Rome. but especially the Pope's primacy has long been a contentious issue in the Church's history. The split between the Catholic and Orthodox Churches is due not only to theological differences, but also to the question of the role of the Pope. The Pope always had many different titles. The Pope is not only the Vicar of Christ, but also the Bishop of Rome. This goes back to the tradition according to which the Holy Apostle Peter was the first Bishop of Rome after Jesus Christ had entrusted him with the task of leading the flock. 
there have been 265 successors to Peter, and each of them has held the title of Bishop of Rome, and each has been a successor in primacy over the whole church. Peter was the first Bishop of Rome after Jesus Christ had entrusted him with the task of leading the flock. Twenty-nine years ago, John Paul II urged a reflection on the nature and exercise of papal primacy. In response, the Vatican presented a study document on June the 13th, 2024, titled, The Bishop of Rome, Primacy and Synodality in Ecumenical Dialogues and Responses to the Encyclical Ut Unum Sint. This document, issued by the Dicastery for Promoting Christian Unity, examines the ongoing dialogue between Christian churches regarding the role of the Pope and the exercise of his ministry. We have the invitation of Pope John Paul II, 95, in his encyclical letter Utunum Sint. He has invited all the churches to enter in a dialogue with him for finding a form of the primacy which not be an obstacle in the, in the future. Despite the many churches and Christian denominations today, theological experts have acknowledged the necessity of a unifying ministry at the universal level. It's the balance between primacy and synodality. You know, sometimes we have the impression this is a contrary, synodal and primacy. And the document says very clearly about all the ecumenical dialogue, this is complementary. We don't have a synodality without primacy, and we don't have primacy without synodality. At the press conference, representatives from other Christian communities also expressed their satisfaction with the new document. As the personal representative of the Archbishop of Canterbury, I am delighted that one of the most comprehensive and detailed responses to St. John Paul II's invitation in Und Unum Sint was given by the House of Bishops of the Church of England in 1997. Synodality among the churches, the document argues, could enable the churches to listen to one another and start joint discernment and decision-making processes on urgent matters of shared concern. Synodality is not just a word of the Catholic Church. No, there are various experiences of solidarity. The various churches have their own way of understanding synodality. The document concludes with a proposal from the dicastery, identifying the most significant suggestions made for a renewed exercise of the Ministry of Unity of the Bishop of Rome, recognized by one and all. Last month, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, mentioned the role of the Bishop of Rome and used the words of Pope Gregory the Great, describing him as the servant of the servants of God. Servus servorum Dei. The Vatican is continuing to work toward the goal that all Christians can walk this path together. Today, Christianity is the most persecuted religious uh, group in the world. According to different organizations, there are more than 300 million followers of Christ in the world who are either discriminated because they are Christian or who are targeted by terrorist organizations or regimes, oppressive regimes, because they give testimony uh, to the name of uh, Jesus uh, Christ. Christian persecution is on the rise. The 2024 annual report on international religious freedom was recently published by the U.S. government in May, highlighting the need for governments around the world to take the lead in ensuring religious freedom. The report assesses global religious freedom conditions and makes recommendations to the U.S. government. USCIRF identified 17 countries for severe religious freedom violations, 
with 12 already on the State Department's list. New recommendations include Afghanistan, Azerbaijan, India, Nigeria, and Vietnam. Hungary, a Central European country, places a strong priority on aiding Christians suffering from persecution. Tristan Azbej, the State Secretary for Aid to Persecuted Christians, holds a unique role on the old continent. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Thonhauser sat down with him to discuss the situation of persecuted Christians around the world. I hold a very unique title in the Hungarian government. My title is State Secretary for the Aid of uh, Persecuted uh, Christians. Hungary has a Christian democratic uh, government and we are the, uh, one of the very few remaining European nations who are proud about our Christian cultural heritage and about our Christian uh, faith. So it only came natural that we started to recognize the extent and severity of uh, Christian persecution in the world. The program was started when uh, we have witnessed the atrocities. It should be the moral obligation, not only of Christian nations, but the rest of the, the world, to support that faith group that is the most persecuted uh, today. This is why the Hungarian government in 2016 set up the first ever governmental unit uh, dedicated to the aid of persecuted Christians. So Christians are the most persecuted religious group in the world. It's a fact that is not widely known. You've been working on this issue now since 2016. Can you tell us a little bit more how, how has the situation de developed? Has it gone, become worse or is it, is it actually improving? Unfortunately, the extent of anti-Christian persecution is, uh, is uh, increasing. It is changing and shifting in nature and uh, geographical locations. When we started to work more than six years uh, ago, ISIS was still active and we had to provide life-saving humanitarian fast uh, relief to Christian and Yazidi, another ethno-religious uh, group that was victimized by ISIS. Since then, ISIS in the Middle East as a caliphate has uh, collapsed, but uh, the number of Christians have been uh, decimated. Uh, there are even more than uh, that. It has shrunk to a very small proportion uh, in the Middle East. For example, in Iraq, there were 1.5 million uh, Christians only two decades ago, now this number is around 200,000, so it's an 80% uh, loss. What we are doing now on the, in, in the Middle East is supporting the institutions, the social, the, the healthcare and education institutions of the small remaining uh, congregations, not only to save Christianity in the wider Holy Land, but also knowing that these Christian institutions also benefiting the non-Christian population, the, the Muslims. So by supporting the Christian churches in the Middle East, we also support other suffering uh, people living uh, along uh, with the Christians. At the same time, the hotspot for violent Christian persecution shifted to the African uh, continent, to the sub-Saharan African um, uh, region. What we witness uh, today in northern Nigeria is almost the same uh, type of bloodshed uh, and anti-Christian aggression that was witnessed in Iraq and Syria in 2014 and the following uh, years. Can you share a little bit what is happening in, in northern Nigeria, especially I believe Boko Haram and the Fulani herdsmen are the main actors there? It has been surveyed that last year around uh, 5,000 Christians were murdered because of their faith around the world. These are the registered cases. It's uh, probably the tip of the iceberg, but out of that 5,000, about 90% were Nigerian uh, Christians. So it, uh, it is a, a mass atrocity amounting up almost to the genocidal uh, level. And it is right because of different type of social uh, conflicts, anti-Christian jihadism, Islamist extremism is on the rise. Uh, creating terrible murder groups, terrorist groups like uh, Boko Haram. The Islamic State uh, terrorist organization also is uh, present in Western um, uh, Africa. And there are other uh, Fulani extremist uh, jihadists who systematically uh, murder um, uh, Christians. Just one example, last uh, Christmas, in the course of uh, two days, 
around 300 uh, Christians were murdered by uh, Fulani extremists in uh, uh, Nigeria. So this is what we focus uh, on. I can uh, uh, report proudly uh, so that through the Hungary Helps program and through Christian faith-based humanitarian engagements, we have directly reached more than two million suffering uh, people in the, uh, in the world. And what brings you to Rome? I came here for two reasons, uh, to meet uh, high-ranking uh, officials of the Holy See and also of the uh, Italian uh, government. With the Holy See and with the Catholic Church, we have been uh, cooperating ever since we have started our mission for persecuted uh, Christians. It only comes natural. Our program and our approach is uh, ecumenical. We work for the persecuted Catholics, Orthodox and Protestants. Mr. Arspace, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for this interview. Thanks for the opportunity. We'll be back after a short break with a visit to the Mamertine prison in Rome, where the apostles Peter and Paul were imprisoned shortly before their martyrdom. Stay tuned. Mamertine Prison, hidden below the Church of St. Joseph of the Carpenters, among the ruins of ancient Rome, lies the city's oldest maximum security prison, the Mamertine Prison. Situated at the foot of the epicenter of the Roman Empire, in front of the Forum Romanum, the center of public life, it was a clear warning symbol of Rome's unappeasable justice against its enemies. So the enemies of state of ancient Rome were kept in this prison. It wasn't a prison for petty thieves. It was the prison for the enemies of state, for the most important people uh, that uh, they, they wanted people to see uh, the, that these people were being tortured here and they were being sentenced to death. Among the many historical figures condemned to death by starvation, strangulation, or beheading in the Mamertine prison, several deserve to be mentioned. Jugurtha, king of Numidia, and Gallic chieftain Vercingetorix, both publicly executed by strangulation in 104 and 46 BC, respectively. Accused of treason for refusing to ascribe absolute power and divinity to the Roman Emperor Nero, it is also believed that this is the prison where Saints Peter and Paul were held in captivity before their martyrdom. Despite the harsh conditions of their imprisonment, Christian tradition recounts a miraculous event said to have occurred in the deepest level of the prison as a sign of God's blessing and mercy to the martyrs in a time of strife. Uh, for example, Peter was able to give witness to the gospel even here in the Mamertine prison, his own prison guards who were watching over him, uh, he was able to tell them about the gospel. And they listened to his words and they welcomed the message of the gospel into their hearts and they wanted to be baptized, but there was no water with which to baptize them. So Peter would have had water spring forth miraculously and he was able to use that water to baptize them. These prison guards, their names are Processus and Martinianus, and so they themselves became martyrs uh, of the gospel. These two figures, we know about them ever since the, the Roman martyrology talks about them since the first centuries. And then at some point in medieval times, their stories are connected with those of Peter and Paul. Following their baptism, the two warders were then arrested, tortured, and beheaded by order of the Emperor Nero. Without exception, the two apostles met a similar fate. After their imprisonment, tradition holds that St. Peter was crucified upside down in Nero's circus on the Vatican Hill, where the obelisk called The Witness stands today. 
St. Paul is said to have been decapitated since Rome didn't allow its citizens to be crucified. Peter and Paul showed great courage with their martyrdom, it meant uh, embracing the cross, embracing the cross in their lives, and not only in an individual manner, but together. Peter and Paul, who had very different personalities, different approaches, different charisms, still had a great respect for one another and wound up sharing together the experience of martyrdom here in Rome. Whether or not the Mamertine prison was the actual place of Saints Peter and Paul's imprisonment, their lives and deaths are without a doubt a testimony to a persevering faith. So the martyrs give us an example of, of great courage in standing up for what is right and just. And martyrdom is a gesture of great love. Peter, do you love me? Are you ready to give your life for me? So martyrdom is a, is a story not only of standing up for what is true, but also of great love, of giving one's life over for God and for neighbor.